My name is Anne McElhenney. August, I'm Phelan McAleer. Welcome to the Anne and Phelan Scoop. It's uh, week 46, that's 11 months and a bit of the two week flat, the curve lockdown. I began, Phelan, you'll notice, to become a little bit more vague about how long it is since the lockdown because I was counting the, the weeks and I feel like I might have made an error because rather than doing the calendar months, right, I'm doing the four week months, right? Yes. Do you understand the yes. difference, right? So anyway, whatever. So basically, we're very close to a year. It's very close to a year. Since the government lied and said it's just going to be two weeks. So we have a lot of Hunter Biden news that we will be bringing to you today. On today's show. And yes. there's a pandemic and the schools, the teachers and the teachers unions are teaching us about what really, really matters. Yes, indeed. In this t pandemic time. And how bloody wokeness is destroying my TV. We'll be looking at that. And the squad's tearful non-post non-traumatic syndrome speech. Do you like that? Yes. Non-post, non-traumatic syndrome speech. We're yeah. going to get into that. And the New York Times have an expose about Costco chicken. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. But it's more of an expose of the New York Times journalism than it is about anything to do with a wee well, chicken. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's exposes the New York Times attitude to journalism. Correct. And that then segues beautifully into me being able to do a, a recipe involving chicken and I have something very very lovely from the internet but we want to start by the way today by telling a little story um, about what happened to us over the weekend and how I learned something about my husband well that's not true actually actually you know what that's probably not true you actually behaved in total character so we went out to dinner Woohoo! because we're free now and the yes. restaurants are open here so we went out to celebrate and uh, it's up on was it up on Fairf up in Melrose it's up somewhere there up up there in the nice place a lovely restaurant Melrose so uh, yeah we, we live in Venice we're, we're driving up to Melrose which is like a 45 minute drive 35 minute drive through the grimy parts of LA and some and not so grimy of, and, and some not so grimy and not so grimy and by the way it's getting late and I'm realising we're going to be five minutes late and we're very very punctual and I don't like that so but anyway we're stopped at the lights and we're about three miles away from the restaurant I remember looking at the map and thinking we're three miles away and we're sitting there at the lights and then guess what happens so the lights, I believe the lights changed mm. to green and a truck comes no, barreling. No, I think they were in orange, but anyway. Well, so, but a lady walked across the pedestrian crosswalk in front of us, I believe probably against her signal, she wasn't supposed to walk. And what comes barreling across the junction, only a white pickup truck, probably trying to beat the lights, and smacked into her bicycle and knocked her down. And right in front of us, right there in front of us, uh, like in glorious Technicolor. And I looked and I could literally look, almost look inside on to the truck, but I couldn't see and he was just a little bit past and immediately jumped out to help the lady. The truck driver stopped, the driver of the truck stopped. He drove forward a little, stopped again and then drove off. It was a hit and run. An actual hit and run. So I'm out there on the street. So I've jumped out of the car. I have... Uh, 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 you're, you you jumped okay, out of the car. I Don't be giving away the, the story uh, to help. And I am looking at this truck, not exactly barreling off, but going off. So I do immediately do a U-turn. So from my angle, I see Phelan speeding off after the white truck. By the way, quick quick to mention that the girl is fine. Uh, okay. The girl is fine. No, I think that because people will be listening upset. upset well, think no, I thought the girl was injured. Right, she was injured. So I thought, oh, she well, was injured, the cops she, yeah. were coming, the ambulance were coming, but I, and I, you know, I was only going to go and get a picture of the number plate, the license, as you guys say, the license plate of the, of the truck. So at this stage, the truck is well, I thought I won't even catch it because although I said, you know, it didn't happen as quick. It took me a few minutes to think I should go. So I, I go around a few corners, a few hills, and there's the truck in front of me, quite a distance away now, quite a distance away. And it goes around the corner and I put the shoe down and... There it is again, it's right in front of me. And next thing I see, I take a left turn down a quiet street and I go, okay, he's going home or whatever. So I follow the truck and we come out onto a really, really, he goes out onto a really, really busy, a big road. And I think, okay, I can follow him out there. And just as I am coming out on the road, there's a light up above and they change. And this suddenly 50 cars come flying and I have to wait for them. So I'm then suddenly 50 cars and a lot of time behind the truck. The truck is gone. There's no point in me even trying Cut to... Cut to me. Back over there with the lady who has been tossed off the bicycle. Now both of us are standing, be her beside her bicycle, and her name is Mary, and she's really nice. And I've checked out that she's fine. The bike is destroyed. And 
she just wants to go home and I said to her, where do you live? And she said, I live two blocks from here. So, you know, after spending quite a bit of time with her, she toddled off and she was fit to walk and all of that. And I got her telephone number and I thought, I'll, you know, I'll phone her later on to see that she's okay. And then I thought, so I'm standing on the, on the, on the thing and, and I realise I don't have a phone. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, I, don't so we, have, I need to mention, Anne's phone was left. I don't, in- I don't have a phone, I don't have any money and I don't have a mask. So there you go. So that's quite yes, a dilemma, your, right? Because your phone is in the car. Yes. When I drove off, Correct. your phone was sitting there. When Phelan there. When abandoned jumped, me. When Anne jumped out. When Phelan when Anne jumped abandoned out, me. When Anne jumped out to and help then of course, the lady. So I stand there for a while. She and didn't when the lady, take her phone. When the lady leaves, I'm thinking, the lady's, the lady's like, I said, my husband will be back in a minute. You know, he's just gone, whatever, he'll be back. Then, then she's gone, and then it's like five minutes. Of course, I don't know because I don't have a timepiece, but I realise a lot of time is passing. And, I'm th- and then I'm remembering who I'm married to. I'm married to someone who has a disturbingly bad sense of direction. And I'm thinking, wherever he is now, he's lost. And whatever it is that I can be get- sure of, he has no idea how to get back to where I am. So then I think I need to start walking. Yeah, so I, and then I, 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 remember, just, I-, and I remember that I have three miles to go to get to the restaurant, and I also don't know which direction to go in. So I start walking, can I, I just, end up on this really dark Can I just road. say, at this stage, I am driving around trying to recreate my steps. And I even went to the stage of re-putting in the directions from our home to the restaurant and trying to go along that doesn't road. Doesn't work like that. Doesn't work like that because the, the road had changed. And I have no this clue. This is LA, by the way. And by the way, I didn't, look at the, I didn't look at the street names that we were. I, mean, I could when have been murdered. When I could have been murdered. When you're in GPS, you don't pay any attention you're to the street names. I could have been murdered. Start walking down a dark street and I think, oh God, this is far too dark. So I came out smart enough. I went, then I found a brighter street and I walked along very, very posh houses. And I thought, you know what? I can't drive. You can't go up and knock on the door of one of these houses. Because I just thought, I couldn't think of a simple way to tell a story that didn't sound like I was trying to, you know, con people into, okay, t- okay. into stealing their, I need to, I, their I need, posh dog or something. I need to. Uh, so now I am getting increasingly anxious and increasingly anxious. Good. And the people... Uh, we are meeting in the restaurant, are phoning, very worried, because we're never late. Phoning on both phones. And they're phoning on both phones. So eventually I answer the phone and I said, this is, and I explain the situation. And the guy is a lawyer and he's, he's, um, he's, he's smart and he goes, okay, I am, he says, well, have a look at Waze or whatever, there might be an accident. I says, I'm trying to find, he says, I will look at Waze, which is the app that tells you about accidents on, on roads. I will also look at the Citizen app, which will talk about a hit and run. Because I assumed that the girl, it, you guys had phoned the cops, that there was a whole incident going on, that the girl was being treated. No. So then I saw an ambulance flying past, no, right? No. So I immediately turned and followed the ambulance because I assumed that was the ambulance heading towards it, but of course you can't follow an ambulance. So I they, walk along this really, red lights. meanwhile, I walk along this really quite nicely lit, luckily, road with all the beautiful houses and I think I can't walk into any of these houses and no one's gonna let me in, no one's gonna hand. So then eventually, in the distance I see a busy road. Even with your white privilege. Even with my white privilege. In the distance I see a busy road and I see at the corner, manna from heaven, a 7-Eleven. Then I realize, of course, I don't have a mask. So I look in and there's a guy um, I think Indian, and he's wearing a mask, right? And of course he's wearing a mask. And I kind of go do this indication, I'm not wearing a mask, but can I come in? I've got a problem. And eventually he, he allows me in. But there's a little bit of, you know, back and forth where he wants me to wear a mask, and I'm saying I don't have a mask. So then I go in and I kind of, imbro- you know, I basically tell him the story, but I don't think he really understood. Can you phone my husband? Can you phone? And so the next thing, he takes the phone out, he dials the number, and he hands me the phone, which was really kind. And I said to Phelan, where I was? And then Phelan sped up and got me. And I went back into that shop. I was six shop. minutes away. I went back into the shop. I got money off my husband. And I went back into the shop. And a new guy was behind the desk at that point. And I said, where's the other guy? He rang the bell. The other guy came out. He wasn't wearing a mask. I said, are you the guy I just spoke to? And he said, you want to talk to your husband? And I went, oh, you are the guy. And I gave him $20. And I can tell you one thing. It was like every Christmas in his lifetime had just happened at the one time. It was the best money I ever spent. Eventually, we got to the restaurant, and uh, I have to say, I think the thing that comes, I think the really big, a couple of big takeouts from this story. One, how nice was I when you turned up in the car, Phelan? The, much nicer than you expected. Uh, much nicer than you expect than I expected. I was expecting a, a legitimate tirade. No, I realise that you're a good guy, and you went off and tried to do the good thing, Robin Hood style. But I, I think, quite quickly after I got in the car, I said, "This needs to never happen again." And the answer from you was. This will never happen this again. This will never happen again. And my answer also is take your phone every time you get out of the car. No, I think this will never happen again. And also, by the way, I think it's not a great idea to speed after people who are clearly criminal types because who in their right mind 
with speed off when somebody's on the ground and you've hit them with your car. Like, who would do that? This is a lunatic. This is a bad person, by the way. Okay, not that I'm segueing from the saying bad person to Hunter Biden, but that's just the way it seems to be. Hunter Biden is in the news uh, for lots of reasons. Lots of reasons. For lots of reasons. And you probably know his memoir is coming out in April. Uh, and will be published by, I think, Simon and it's Schuster. It's called Beautiful Things because he really likes buying beautiful things. Appearing all week. Uh, Salem McAleer, yes, with the one-liners. Comic so basically club. he Take is, my wife, please. He's beautiful things. He, um, he's got an advance of $2 million. And interestingly enough... Well, tell us about the memoir first, Phelan. What do you think this memoir is going to do? Do you think it's going to tell us the whole breakdown, the whole Burisma thing, how he got no, on the board, how they chose him, why he's getting presents from Chinese people, why he got $3 million from the mayor of, of Moscow's wife? You think it's going to be all that, all that nice detail? This memoir is, is actually not for Hunter Biden. It's not for Joe Biden. It's not for his family. It's not for addicts everywhere. It's for journalists everywhere to say he's been very honest about his past. Uh-huh. And to, 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 to become a born again virgin is what he's going yeah, to do. Yeah, he's laundering himself. He's laundering and he's a journalist. He's allowing journalists to launder his past. There you go. By saying, well, he was, you know, why would we investigate Hunter Biden's past? Because he's been brutally honest. Our investigations couldn't uncover anything uh, as brutally honest as his addiction memoir will be. But of course, the memoir will not talk, as you say, about the three million he got from the mayor of Moscow. Let's listen to the president of the United States talk about his son's memoir that's about to come out. New tonight, President Biden also discussed his son, Hunter. You know, I'll bet there's not a family you know that doesn't have somebody in the family that had a drug problem or an alcohol problem. Hunter addresses those problems in a new memoir. But the honesty with which he stepped forward and talked about the problem and the hope that it gave me hope reading it. I mean, it was like, my boy's back. You know what I mean? He's Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry to get so personal. Oh, it's very affecting, isn't it, Phil? That's very affecting. As he says, he has his boy back. Can mm. I just say, saying that about a grown man who is a father of five children is a little something, right? My yeah. boy back. It's where he's 12 years I old. I tell you, it's you know? a king Lear, this, this, their relationship, you know. And I think at the end of the day, I'm not sure Hunter likes his dad but anyway um, yeah but i love this line you know from from the president you know president biden the honesty with which he stepped forward i think the word honesty and hunter biden i don't think these are words that sit well together but let's have a look at the other news from hunter biden which i think is very enjoyable given the fact that on this particular program you know that we have a particular a particular affection for property and yes. for looking at other people's property. So guess where Hunter Biden decided to come and live? He decided to come and live in Los Angeles. And he originally came, and a bit like us, Phil, a little bit like ourselves, he originally landed and spent time in the Hollywood Hills. We're having a look now, Phil, at the place he originally came to. Yes. Nice little pad. Nice little nice pad. Nice little pad. Just $12,500 a month. Do you know yes. the way you pay that in rent? Sure, sure, we're all doing it. That's right. So that was the lovely spot he was in there. But you know what? It wasn't good enough for him. It wasn't Phelan. good enough for our it hunter. It wasn't good enough for our hunter. And you know what I think? It's kind of interesting, and this will be for anyone who's not from Los Angeles, a little bit of, history, little bit of geography of Los Angeles. Let us explain to you the problem with that property that you're looking at there, the one in the Hollywood Hills, is it's a bit isolated. It's very right? isolated. It's very That's isolated. That's why we moved from the Hollywood Hills, actually. Yeah, because we didn't like being so isolated, because we quite like cycling or walking to the coffee shops. And guess who else and likes people that? Out and, about. and guess who likes that as well? Hunter. So here's where Hunter has moved to this little property. I, and if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see this. You'll see the lovely and photographs. If you're listening to it on the audio, really, you, you should, need to be looking on YouTube. You, you need to go over to the YouTube because to look at the photographs. So have a look at this. So this is the little property he's moved to now, which and a real bargain, Phelan, by the way. It's a $5.4 million home, and he is getting it for the bargain price rental of $25,000 a month. And sure, could, we'd all, sure, we're all in those kind of houses. And could people please tell us in the comments if that is a good return on investment, actually, for the person. Um, actually, see, it's got a, and it's, look, it's got a sort of That's circular lovely. nautical window, like one of them submarines. That reminds me of that house uh, between outside Balik on the way to Bandoran. There's a house with a round window there. Fair enough. That's a reference for you. We're looking now at the lovely living room. There, yeah, uh, by the way, there, that's Venice Boulevard behind it there. You see that? Oh, yeah. And by the way, so here's what we know, by the way. And you guys, we, got, we, we stole these photographs so from, the just, daily, from the Daily Mail, but they're actually from the MLS. These are property photographs directly opposite the street of where this property is now. It's quite funny. And Phelan and I, before we even knew that Hunter Biden had moved to Los Angeles, can I just say... We were driving around Abbott Kinney the other day, like we saw whatever, a month ago, whatever, maybe three, four weeks ago. And the next thing we saw, all these kind of big 
SUVs with blacked out windows. And yes. we said someone important must be in town. Because, and these are not, you, see, you do see a lot of people in SU, black SUVs here in LA with security details, but this was different because people in security details, they're no, pretty normal SUVs. These were not, not, these were completely blacked out. They were all information. And they were parked somewhere, I can't even remember where now. And I just thought it was odd. And it yeah. turns out it's Hunter. Can I also say, we, we should say that, that this house of Hunter's, I mean, it is literally within a stone's throw of our house. Oh yeah. Like we can literally, well, if I, back he's in the day- He's basically when following I was, us, Phil. He's, he's following us. So I think he wants us to spend a lot of time on his expose, because he's actually moved in. It's very convenient and for we're us. Going, we have to, you know, people, knew, uh, we, I'm sure you all know we're involved in a Hunter Biden project, which we're going to be going public with very quite soon. soon. And I think this is a sign. I think this is a okay, sign. Okay, let's talk with Hunter's property. Let's so here's the house. So let's have a look inside. There's the lovely living room there now. That's grand. And there's a window there down the That's side. That's not the living room. That's the living room, Phil. That's the living room. Isn't that lovely? Look at how big that is. And look at the lovely, um, what you call that, skylights. Skylight. Beautiful skylights. Uh, I don't like this window much. No, it's no I don't love that. It is looking out. The wall. So if you look at that photograph, this is a huge living dining area. And by the way, two tables. And by, you know what that's for, by the way? You know what that's for? The grown-ups table and the table for the five children. Oh, you know what? I bet it's not for the five children because one of those children lives in uh, deepest, darkest Arkansas and has, hard, has been denied uh, repeatedly by his yes. family. The, 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 stripper First family. the stripper's child probably sits... Probably no, the stripper's it, child doesn't get to go to that uh, house Exactly, no, it's not allowed in the house at all, yeah. Now we're moving into the master suite. And you'll see now the master suite. Very pleasant there, what's by that? the way. What's that? No, hang on, oh, that's Philip. a sauna, is it? No, what's that? Oh, no. What is that? That's a sauna. Oh, that's a sauna. I didn't in even the spot master that. Suite. So there's a sauna in the master suite. Well, you know the way you need that. And then look at sure every house needs that. The there's rooftop the roof deck. The rooftop deck with the lovely fireplace and the lovely lighting and the twinkly lights of Los Angeles yes. in the distance. Yes, yes. Isn't that lovely? Yes. And then here's another photograph because you know the way you need it. Even though you're right beside the beach, you do need a pool. So there's the little dipping pool that they have there, which is pretty small. Can by I just the way. say something? You can film because it's your show. It is the Alan Film Show. I'm not an expert in addiction, right? Um, but I just don't know if a $25,000 a month house in Venice, which has more drug addicts Correct. than you could shake a stick at, Correct. is a great move for a guy who's, who's a drug addict and wants to stay clean. That's right. You know, it's, it, it's, it, there's just so, you know. Sure, we're nearly, sure we're nearly falling over ourselves with all those pot shops. Like, which is legal here, right, by the way. But also but there's drug addicts in every corner. There are. Uh, uh, camping there are. and tent, you know, he can literally, he could literally, they could literally fire drugs up to his balcony. There's, there's tons of drugs. Well, you might have a tr small tr trouble doing that, given the fact that all these heavy boys are sitting in the cars. So he has this 24, 24 seven uh, security detail watching after him. I have and a question, huh? You, will you go ahead and ask in, that question, you know, Philip? I, I, I hope I, I can answer it. Well, actually, uh, in the, oh, you know, I'm did not- Did you make coffee? I did. For me? No, for no. myself. No. It's a bit naughty now. Do you want coffee? No, I'll just drink my water. Go on ahead there. I'm just drinking my coffee now. Well, you enjoy can see that. On YouTube. I could, I could have a drink of that, but, you could. but, but there's no milk in it. Go on ahead. Um, so, if, you know, Hunter has been in many rehab facilities, uh, some more successful than others. If in the in the event, and I don't wish this on anyone, that this one fails, and he wants to go out and buy drugs, or someone wants someone to come and deliver drugs, what's the position of the Secret Service in that situation? Well, this is a question that I think we have a very intelligent um, group of people yes. watching. We would like to hear from you because we'd like to know what's the situation there. Put a For comment. Example, put a yeah. comment in YouTube, or yeah. put a comment in the so podcast if you visit, app. If you get in, if you put you, a comment in the podcast app. Uh, yeah, if you want to go and visit him there at the house. Does he have to register your name and look for it? Yeah, we need to know this. Do people get searched going in? This is it. We do not We do not know that. Anyway, we will be keeping you up to date on all things Hunter. Yes, all things Hunter because we are, we are launching a Hunter Biden project. So, uh, so from the uh, ridiculous to the supremely ridiculous and awfully sad, um, Barry Weiss has written a piece. She's the former New York Times columnist who resigned uh, because the New York Times is an intolerable she's become, place to work. She's become quite fascinated by how awful things are in schools across the United States. And we're going to, you know, um, and she's written an article about it that's in her super stack. How do you say where it is, Phil? We'll put the link sub -stack. up. In sub stack. We'll put it up, um, a link in the, in the show notes. But basically the headline is spirit murder, neo 
segregation and science denial in American schools. So people have been writing to her and telling her about what's going on in schools across the country. And funny enough, the first few schools that, they, that people wrote to her about are here in Los Angeles. So Harvard Westlake is a private high school here. And the fees for Harvard Westlake are $41,300 a year. So there's a, I mean, it's not a way of, I mean, it's not incredible. Imagine if you had four children. Well, you can, I mean, obviously, you know, you wouldn't be sending them to Harvard Westlake, I suppose. And by the way, there's more reasons for not sending your children to Harvard Westlake than just the fees. Mm -hmm. And here's the reason. Um, basically, the dean recently lavished praise upon Tamika Mallory and Linda Sarsour, both Louis Farrakhan fans, yes. in a high school-wide assembly. The good old anti-Semite um, uh, Louis Farrakhan, uh, who's got more anti-Semitism than you could shake a stick at. And, uh, you know... It's it's just amazing that these people are, are you know he, he praised them in front of the children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they have printed the school a twenty-page plan uh, outlining their anti-racist programs, and I printed it out, and it is unbelievable of what they're going to do. Recent and ongoing work addressing the effects of conscious and unconscious bias in science mm -hmm. in ninth grade biology film the boiling point of water is is hugely racist it is uh, and sexist and yes. it's probably ageist as well by the way yes. the other thing that they're going to spend time gravity. doing gravity the other is, thing, is, and film has a brilliant answer to this that i find that he's going to say in one minute here I do? yes i'm going to tell you i'm going to remind you what it is i'm welcoming basil kincaid and Jana ireland two prominent black actors our artists to display their work speak at the school assemblies and teach master classes with students in visual arts. Actually, that's not, there's nothing that yeah, bad in that. I would assessing, arts, hang on, I love this though. Assessing word problems in math and rewriting them to be more representative and culturally sensitive. Any idea what that's about, Philip? Yeah, well, I don't know what that's about, but I do know China is- China are celebrating. Laughing, they're having a ball. They're saying, we are putting, we're producing physicists, chemists, biologists, yeah. people to make the Wuhan flu in labs, people to, to make weapons, people to do, people to steal other people's intellectual property, all uh, people to use, uh, steal other people's uh, software, hardware, the whole thing. And uh, they're, they're, re they're re re assessing word problems in math and rewriting them to be more representative and culturally sensitive. And they're also redesigning the 11th grade US history course from a critical race theory perspective. But it's not just uh, Harvard Westlake Dalton, which is in Manhattan, tuition 54,180 a year, makes Harvard Westlake look almost conservative. This is Barry Weiss, that's, what, that's her analysis. So they have a manifesto to deal with anti-racism, which is only eight pages long in comparison to the 20 pages from Westlake. I wouldn't send my child there. But its demands include abolishing high-level academic courses by 2023 if the performance of black students is not on par with non-blacks. Can you help me with that one, Philip? They're going to abolish high-level academic courses. They're going to abolish them. So what will they replace them with? Low-level academic courses. Anyway, they're also, by the way, and of course, this is where the money is coming well, from. That's why it's going to cost. They're going to hire 12, this is a high school, 12 full-time diversity officers and multiple psychologists to support students coping with race-based traumatic stress. If you're the child of Jewish people, people whose grandparents say for example were killed in the holocaust correct would that be a rate would you qualify i don't know because the problem with that is that you might be white uh, yeah so you'd be white you see so basically see that thing about you know if, if the performance of black students is not on par with non-blacks you do you know the most successful ethnic grouping in the united states at the moment i do because you've told me a few times it's nigerian nigerians who are black yeah so what basically they're going to do is get a bunch of nigerian children in there and that'll get them that'll, that'll get, get it sorted yeah brentwood another school tuition is forty-five thousand there they've announced some dialogue and community building sessions we're going to put this thing up on screen you won't believe this which actually segregate segregates this is families very, by race. Sad. This look, is look very on your, sad look at the screen right now so what they're going to do is and here you go thursday january the 28th faculty white faculty are going to meet and in the afternoon black fa faculty White staff, black staff, white parents and families, black parents and families. I'm reading this schedule that they have here. Wednesday, February the 3rd, Hispanic and Latinx parents. Phil, what's Latinx? Remind me what Latinx means. That's, as Michelle Obama would say, 
Michelle, remember when Michelle Obama used to say Latino. 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 Obama say that? Latino. She can do it better. She she do it, let's do it again, Michelle. Latino. That's everyone decided Latino and Latina is always racist. Sexist and sexist. There you go. She say Latinx. Exactly. Parents and families. Upper school. So basically, they are they're doing segregation. And by the way, we had heard this. We have a friend who basically took his kid out of school when the school started doing this segregation thing and dividing children into these different ethnic groups. Racist. They're just. Um, I mean, we know kids who've been at school and never know them. Uh, that they were black, never knowing there was any racism until the school told them. Yeah, and then they were de- devastated. But it's not just these private schools that have this nonsense. The public schools are just as bad. So the San Francisco public school system has not been open since the beginning of the pandemic. Latino. But the board just renamed 44 schools, including those named for George Washington, obviously slave owner, colonizer, Herbert Hoover, who accepted apparently white supremacy, and, and John Moore, who I thought he was a big environmentalist, right? Yes. The racist. Um, but watch this clip. This is magnificent. Watch this clip. Uh, this, by the way, it's kind of funny, right? But it's it's not really Who funny. Is she? So she is a commi- she's an education commissioner, Alison Con- Collins, who will explain what's wrong with merit. Merit. Yeah. That merit is actually racist. Let's have a listen to her. When we talk about merit, meritocracy, and especially meritocracy based on standardized testing. I'm just going to say it in this day and age, we cannot miss words. It, those are racist systems. Well, if you're going to say that merit, you know, is like fair, it's, it's the antithesis of fair and it's the antithesis of just. So there you have it. That is merit very is sad. the it's antithesis very sad. of fair. It's the antithesis of fair. It's, very sad. it's unbelievably sad. And I mean, Here's, here's the problem with all of this. If you go, if you, God help you, you know, got cancer or whatever, and you end up in the hospital and the oncologist is coming towards you, are you going to be saying to yourself, are you going to be looking at that person? And if that person is from an ethnic group, think, um, <laughs> did you actually do as well in the exams as the other guy? Because I don't care what color you are. I just want the yeah. best oncologist. Yes. I want the one who did, I, you know, I want this to be a meritocracy. I want people to have done their exams and to come to the top and done really well. And that be the person that is wielding the knife or giving yeah. you the chemotherapy. And again, by the way, this is happening everywhere. The Seattle public schools are saying that the, educa- the education system is committing spirit murder against black children. As opposed children. to the actual murder of black children that's taking place place in many inner cities. I mean, Chicago, every weekend, yeah. there's a black school child killed yep. by other black people, yeah, but, we're, we're, not, but we're, not, we're, we're not out in the streets for that. No. And the New York City public schools are telling white teachers they are guilty of the same. Spirit murdering has even been made its way into the new administration. Joe Biden's Deputy Secretary of Education, Cindy Martin, a superintendent of the San Diego school system, she endorsed the idea, as well as the notion that white teachers should undergo anti-racist therapy. And by the way, it's not a suggestion. It's mandated. Spirit, the anti- I thought spirit murdering is what people in Ireland do in pubs after 1 a.m. on a Friday night. Boom, boom. Oh. Oh. Whiskey there, bar keep. Spirit murdering. But have a check, check this lovely guy out. David Kirkland is the vice dean of no relation, equity. David Kirkland, no relation to Costco. No relation to Costco, but we're going to talk about Costco later. The vice dean of equity at NYU Steinhardt Metro Center has upped the ante, saying that schools are murdering the bodies of our children. Let's have a listen to him. Today... I want to ask how might we change our job descriptions in this moment of pause? How might we in a post-COVID education world make education you know, more anti-racist, more culturally responsive and sustaining and radically reimagined for all of our students? How do we call for new institutions that instead of murdering the bodies of our children, love them instead? So there you have it. And this is all for, this is from Barry Weiss's- uh... This is from Barry Weiss's fabulous column where she goes into all of this kind of stuff. But it goes on, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's really terrible. And then I, funny, before I read Barry Weiss, I had come across this Twitter thread, this awful Twitter thread. So, you know, and this is from, so a writer um, and columnist was asked, her name is, by the way, and you can check this out yourself, Anne Bauer. And I think she's not, you know, I think she's definitely a liberal. Um, She was asked to sit in on a Zoom meeting of parents um, from the Minnesota area. She doesn't identify exactly where in Minnesota this happened. But, the, the, but there was a Zoom meeting allowing parents to, to, to dis- discuss 
um, what was going on with their kids who have not been in school for a year. Um, she says, I'm not going to name the district or the legislator. I was a guest and that's their business. The thing I will tell you, however, however bad, sad and depressing I thought it would be, it was worse. So she said, let me start by saying this is a wealthy district, maybe one of the top five in the state. The parents are almost all white professionals. To be honest, I'm almost discount, I almost discounted it. I thought, they're fine, they'll be all right because they're rich, right? There were parents who said they'd never seen their kids dark or hopeless or unhappy. And I believe it. Their suburb is the Shangri-La of Minnesota. I know, we know the places. We know those places. They described girls who hid in their rooms and cried and boys falling so far behind they might never catch up. Over and over, because they were nice people, they kept on acknowledging during this Zoom that they were really lucky. They said they have money for tutors and electronics, and they're, but they're worried about families that don't. I believe them. Still, what surprised me is how money, how money didn't make this situation better for these parents. These parents looked terrified. Wait till you hear this, this is just terrible. Two of the fathers cried. One turned off his video because he couldn't keep it together. Two of the moms had outbursts and I couldn't blame them. And it goes on and on. It's just horrible. And, but the interesting thing as well, of course, is that they have a senator in on the phone call, right? Mm -hmm. They have a senator in on the Zoom, you know? Um, they had a child, by the way. One of the people who spoke at the Zoom thing was a child, a teenager who was about 15. And she was so eloquent and dear and intensely respectful. This is Anne Bauer saying it. She started sobbing halfway through and said she got to a very dark place and she didn't know if she'd ever get out. So the senator was then asked to speak. Now, as, as Anne Bower says, the, the senator was in a very tough spot and she thanked everyone. Then, as Anne Bower says, then, oh my God, this is true. She talked about the trade-offs and the fact that other businesses also had to deal with shutdowns. So someone had to remind her that schools aren't a business and weren't supposed to act like businesses. And at this point, she pivoted and for reasons I will never understand, started talking about how she herself had to go to the Capitol because she was a public servant and there were certain partisan senators refusing to wear masks. Like she just went, you know, basically talked complete nonsense, complete nonsense. But this is the kind of story we're seeing all over, yeah, all yeah. over the place. Please, really, the really. The government is killing your kids. But, you, but Anne Bauer ends the Twitter thread by saying, my advice to every, this is incredible, by the way. My advice, and as I said, this woman is liberal. My advice to every parent in Minnesota tonight and remember, I'm raw, and this is, she was really upset when she heard these people talking about what was going on with their kids. And on edge, and probably not in my camera state. My advice, move. Kids are going to in-person school in Florida, and in Texas, and Pennsylvania, and MA, where's MA? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. We're one of the few places that is, that is broken. Go, I would. But tell Governor Tim Waltz when you do. Isn't yeah. that incredible? Amazing. Really terrible, just awful. Um, so Rashida Talib, yes, the wonderful Congresswoman, let's hear her describe the terrible days of January the 6th uh, when uh, a gunman came in and started shooting members of the Democratic Congressional Caucus who were playing baseball. Oh no, sorry, that, oh, was, no, that, was, a different one. that was Bernie Sanders supporter who did that, uh, who almost wiped out 10% of the Republican caucus, but no one remembers that. Uh, so let's hear her talk about how a bunch of protesters and right, a mob a mob went in and basically did a sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office. So let's hear her talk about the trauma. So what happened on January 6th, all I could do was thank Allah that I wasn't here. I felt overwhelming relief and I feel bad for Alexandria, so many of my colleagues that were here. But as I saw it, I thought to myself, thank God I am not there. Huh. So, so she wasn't there filming. So, you know, uh, stolen valor is a thing that I've only learned about when I came to America. We don't really have that idea in, in, in the UK, stolen valor. But then can, can you have stolen trauma as well? And so she's stealing it, as you can see there in the video, standing beside her is AOC. So she's stealing the trauma from, from AOC, but the really funny thing is that it didn't happen to AOC either. Well, you know, at least AOC was in the building, in a building. In a building, but very far away from yes, any trauma. Yes, and, and no danger. So it's like kind of non, it's non-post, non-traumatic stress, virtue signaling. That's the world we live in, folks. That's the world we live in. Um, and I mean, obviously she, she was, I don't know, it was in a coma or on a different planet during the summer when there were riots and 40 people died. I mean, uh, we're not hearing about that at all, And her right? colleagues were shot uh, on a baseball field by uh, a supporter of Bernie Sanders. So and by the way, the other thing that just, that just occurred and I think we talked about over the weekend film was, um, you know this thing that four people died Five, um, five. Five people died on January 6th. That's right. Well, 
Yeah, and now we found out a very interesting thing about the police officer, correct? That he did the police not. officer who was who lay in state, by the way, right. right, at the Capitol. Has no injuries. But um, now they're trying to blame, but like the... Uh, the, the story in uh, in the resident in the resident they're trying to blame maybe uh, mace spray or pepper spray I mean, I, you know that's how that's the straw so so only one person was died from injuries sustained during the riot and that was someone shot by a capital police officer the in woman, the neck the woman, through a door the woman from San Diego yeah but let's have a look at this peace loving gentle traumatized non non tra traumatized by a non traumatic event. Talib Rashid. Let's see that gentle person earlier. Um, at a previous she was, event. At a previous event. Let's, let's, let's run let's that. Let's have a look. Let's run it. You guys are crazy! You're an animal! Get a job! Ooh, That's her being violent at a Trump rally and being having to be uh, carried out basically because she's uh, disrupting a political process. She's what's called a liar. Or a hypocrite. Yeah, both of them. Anyway, moving on. Oh, Phelan, what did you find out about Costco chicken? Actually, very little. I found out very little about Costco chicken. It's hilarious. Uh, but I did find out that the New York Times now believes that uh, people going in undercover into places with video cameras and, and secretly recording, that is now journalism. So let's have a little look at this, some of that footage. But so it's, a, it's a, an opinion piece by uh, Nicholas Kristof. And it's called The Ugly Secrets Behind the Costco Chicken. Yeah, so investi as he says, an investigator went undercover and brought back disturbing video from a farm growing these famous birds. Yes. And he's praising the, the undercover footage. Yep. Whilst this is the very paper that constantly condemns uh, James O'Keefe, constantly condemns David Delighton for doing exactly the same about much more serious yes. topics. David Delighton was, <laughs> was recording people buying and selling parts of babies. Of human beings. Of human beings. You know, yes, it's not good to have chickens in miser no, miserable we conditions. we don't want chickens. But by the way, let's hear oh, just, yes. just how miserable uh, it is to be a Costco chicken. And the group is called Mercy for Animals. You know, by the way, if you don't know about Costco chickens, they're... They're, they're a lost leader. They're, they're four ninety-nine. They're famous. They're, you know, they're famous. They, they're, you know, it's everyone ra raves about them, as Anne does as well. Yes. And here's what here's what Mercy for whatever animal says. It's dimly lit with chicken poop all over. Said the worker who who filmed there. It, it's like a hot, cloud, humid cloud of am ammonia and poop mixed together. So it smells really badly. It's a chicken farm. If you you know, one thing he does talk about is Herbert Hoover. You know, he he ran on an election in the thirties, I think it was. Uh, on put, you know, I'm going to put a chicken in every pot, and that's back when chicken was a. People don't remember this, of course. Chicken used to be a luxury item, you know. Now it's it's people almost look down on chicken because it's so cheap and so ubiquitous, and that's because they put these chickens in these big places. And then there's this there's this quote from Leah Garces, the, the president of Mercy for Mercy for Animals. They're living on their own feces with no fresh air and no natural light. I don't think that's what a Costco customer expects. I can tell you now, uh, I've spent a little time on farms in my life. That is a lie. They are not living on their own feces. Like, don't be ridiculous. You want to kill chickens? You want to kill any animal? Have them eat their own feces. Like, I mean, it's just, it makes no sense at all. Like, these, one of the big problems with, with, with pigs and chickens is that they, a lot of them uh, are dying. You know, if you have a million chickens, there's a high death rate. And they will do everything. It costs a lot of money. They want to do everything to keep these chickens alive and healthy. And and healthy. So, but I love this. Can I just can I just from this Nicholas Kristof thing? It's amazing. And as Phelan says, keep in mind how David Delighton was treated um, for for exposing something a lot more serious, a lot more important. Here's Nicholas Kristof. When I began writing about these issues, I never guessed that McDonald's would commit to cage-free eggs. Woohoo! That Cor California would legislate protections for mother pigs. Oh. That there would be court fights about whether an elephant has legal personhood. And that Pope Francis would suggest that animals go to heaven and that the Virgin Mary grieves for the sufferings of mistreated livestock. Can you believe this is written, that they've written this mm -hmm. with a straight face? I mean, it is unbelievable. While we actually know what David Delighton did, which he should have got every possible journalism prize for, was exposing the sale of human beings and 
uh, and the aborting of babies in special ways where they wouldn't crush the calvarium so that you could get more money for it. Um, and back to, back to Nicholas Kristof, still the issue remains, as the English, I, I mean, this is so tone deaf, I just can't believe it. Still the issue remains, we're back to the Costco chicken here, by the way. The issue remains, as the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham posed in 1789, the question is not, can they reason? He's talking about the chickens. Nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Actually, you know can good? you believe I this? I might go back into this article and replace chickens with fetuses. Oh yeah. And replace Mercy for Animals yeah. with David the Leiden. Yeah. I bet I bet the whole article would still um, make sense and be a lot more emotive. Oh yeah. I might do that actually. Just read well just read this. Read the, this in the context of what David Still the did. issue remains as the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham posted it in seventeen ninety eight. The question is not can fetuses reason? Nor can fetuses talk, but can they suffer? And we know the answer to that. And they can suffer. And that's why the bill that was recently rejected, rejected by the legislators in Washington, the, the, the piece of legislation they rejected was a piece of re legislation. Well, actually, they, they've rejected loads of legislation. But the most recent one was that a baby born alive, where they made a mistake in the abortion and the child is alive, that that, that child should get all of the you know, emergency, emergency treatment, right? Yeah. To save that baby. And all of the legislators in their wisdom voted against that. That's where we're living. That's the world we're living in now. Yep. Everything's yep. upside down. Everything's completely suffer. crazy. And it's very depressing and it's very awful. And you know what you do need to do into an awful depressing and upsetting situation like that is you need to do something to save your soul. Um, and you can say a prayer and you can also make chicken soup. And it's a very nice segue from talking about the Costco chicken, which is an amazing thing. And every time you go to Costco, you should always pick up one of them because they're marvelous. And if you eat a little bit of the Costco chicken and there's quite a little bit of the chicken left, my advice to you is to make chicken soup. And chicken soup, we have rediscovered chicken soup, haven't we, Philip? Yes. And it's just been so nice. So this is the recipe of the week, is chicken soup. And I love this quote, by the way, from, what's his name? That guy there, Yobin Okalinga. Almost every culture has its own variation on chicken soup, and rightly so. It's one of the most gratifying dishes on the face of the earth. And one of the cheapest dishes on the face of the earth because of the ability to grow, to grow chickens in huge houses uh, cheaply. And by the way, we're not, I, I mean, I don't like the idea of cruelty to animals, by the way, but I, and I actually think you can do, um, if you like, you can honour the food, you honour your food, if you know what I mean. You can honour that chicken by using every bit of that chicken. So here's what you do if you've got a little bit of leftover chicken after roasting a chicken. Put the carcass into a pot, and you're watching me doing it right now. And you're throwing in, you know, basically throw in the kitchen sink after that. So what I did, what we did the other day, is put the whole leftover chicken into the pot, add celery, carrots, onions, parsley, ginger, garlic, peppercorns, bay leaves, and parmesan rinds, by the way, when you make... What is a parmesan rind? So when you have your parmesan cheese, at the end, there's that hard bit, and a lot of people throw it out. Never, ever throw out the parmesan rind. Keep all your parmesan rinds, or any rinds of, of any cheese. Keep the whole lot, and when you're making soup, throw those rinds in. You're going to get all that lovely gooiness off the, off the cheese. Um, any cheese bits as well, throw that in. Some salt into a large soup pot, and cover it with cold water. Then bring it to a boil, but immediately, the minute... You have to watch this now. You have to watch it very James Delling Paul, and I heard him talk about this, that if you, if, if you allow it to boil and keep boiling, you ruin your Ruined. stock. So what you want to do is you want to have it um, shimmering. Bring it down to the lowest possible level, just where you see a slow, smallest break of bubbles at the, on the surface, and leave it there for about, um, about an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, whatever time you have. Um, and then, when that's done, you... Remove the chicken, and you can do that with the thongs. You see the way, and it'll fall to pieces. The chicken will fall to pieces. Take the chicken out and discard all the bones. Then with the bit of chi then you'll find loads of chicken, by the way, floating around, and you'll pull off lots of chicken. Keep that chicken and cut it up onto pieces once, obviously, it's cooled down. Um, taste your broth and simmer it down until it gets more concentrated so you can bring it down a little bit less. I didn't even do that, by the way. We didn't even do that. And then strain everything from the broth. Strain it all into a sieve. And what I would do, and they don't always say this in the recipes, I would pull out the vegetables that are there in their sieve and throw them back in, like your bits of celery, your bits of carrot, throw them back in, your bits of onion, throw them all back in. And then you're putting your meat of your chicken back into the pot. And at this point, now I did this, you don't have to do this, 
I added a spoonful of this stuff, which I what just, is it? it's, I love it. Low. It's called hot chili sauce. It's low gan ma. And Spicy low, chili sauce. Chili, it's called, it's a crunchy chili crisp condiment, which I really like, and it's not super hot. Just a spoon of that is very nice. I also threw in a little bit of cream that I had, again, just hanging around the fridge that was gonna have to be thrown out. So I just threw that in, by the way. You don't have to. Um, and then I had some egg noodles that I bought on a sale and I'd never used them. So I threw them in. They'll take four minutes, three or four minutes. And then just bring your soup to a little simmer for three or four minutes and taste it again, salt and pepper. And you know what? It'll just do you good. It'll do you the world of good to eat that. We have just enjoyed it no end. I think it's mm. going to be in a heavy rotation with us from now on. Something else we thought that we'd share this week that I thought was really sweet. There's a boy, young man. His name is Sam Wilmot. He's 23 years old from a small town outside of Bristol, England. And he, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, he was basically, you know, he had to go home basically. And he decided, he was out one night with friends before, I think just before the thing ended, and he started talking about how much he likes sitting on benches and how he kind of rated them in his mind. Mm -hmm. And his friends for a joke said, do you know what you should do? You should have an Instagram account and you should call it Rate This Bench. And he has an Instagram account called Rate This Bench, and it's really, really fun. You'll see the guy himself sitting here. He's a bit rotund, and he's got this very serious face. And then beside each of these photographs, he writes this description of the bench, of whether or not it's sturdy, whether the arms are nice, whether it's nice for its back, and he gives it a rating out of 10. No bench has got 10 out of 10 yet, by the way. And I just thought there's something pure and lovely about it. And the one photograph is facing him, and the second photograph is from his back, from the his view, head, the of view. the view of what he can see from the bench. I'd highly recommend it. Rate I'm this following bench, it. it's on Instagram. Rate this bench, it's on Instagram. Yes, so, woke TV, wokeness is killing my TV viewing. And I take my TV viewing very seriously, especially my bad TV viewing. And, uh, you know, I watch all the procedurals. I watch The Resident, I watch, uh, you know, The Good Doctor, The Bad Doctor. SUV. Well, I've, I, can't even, I can't watch that anymore. It's just too woke. But um, uh, it was woke before everyone was woke. But since, since basically, uh, the George Floyd, uh, etc., they've just gone all completely woke. Every, and, you know, if, if any of you ever watched these medical procedurals, it basically involves lots of young, good-looking doctors and nurses having sex. Uh, and having family problems and then solving strange diseases with dynamic and, and uh, innovative innovative techniques and intelligence and and they know people and then they realize people are lying or they realize people do certain you know so it's all it's, it's basically a detective a uh, couple of detective shows in, in in a medical procedural and in my in the resident which was which more than most was all about young people having sex uh, a lot uh, they They've just gone completely woke. For example, uh, there was a, this part of the show where a woman comes in with her daughter, the daughter is ill, suddenly the woman has a heart attack uh, or ha gets chest pains and, and collapses and then we flick to the next scene and they're there with the girl, the daughter in bed beside her and the mother seriously ill and they're all wondering what, how, what could be wrong and here's, here's what's wrong and here's how they solve it. Let's play that clip. A kinesis of the poster basal wall, circumflex infarct. Looks like the now diagnostic EKG. Is it that bad? It sounds bad. Wait, mom collapsed because she's actually having a heart attack right now. Oh my god, how is that possible? Uh, EKG shows evidence of another heart attack in the past. Has your mom ever had chest pain or shortness of breath before? A protest. When George Floyd was murdered? We made our signs and we went out there. It was supposed to be peaceful, but it didn't matter. They tear cast us all. That must have been awful. I recovered pretty quickly, but mom said she felt like an elephant was sitting on her chest. I wanted to take her to the hospital, but she was afraid we were going to catch COVID again. Like then, we didn't know if that was possible. She was afraid. Okay. That could be it. Tear gas can cause stress on the heart and aggravate cardiac issues. It's embarrassing that they're shoehorning. I mean, it's just it's like I remember when they used to, you know, has she been on holidays anywhere? Oh yes, she was in Connecticut. Oh, she's picked up a tick disease, Lyme's disease, which which melded with her diabetes, which means she got this 
one in a million rare syndrome yes. that makes her talk backwards. Yes, you know? which is very fun. And yes. that was, yeah, yeah, and, and it was like probably something real as well. Yeah, yeah, it is real. And it must have been great fun trying to fit people's lives into these stories and the sex lives, all that. Now they just go, oh, we need a woke illness now. And, uh, and that's all across the board and it's destroying TV. And in fact, next week we hope to talk about, to John Nolte from Breitbart, about how wokeness is destroying, as he says, the golden age of TV. So it's mm -hmm. bad enough on on primetime, ABC, NBC. But, you know, do you remember a few years ago they talked about Netflix and HBO, this golden age of television, yes. all the yes. actors. And now all these TV series on, on, on these streaming services are being destroyed by wokeness. And they're not focusing on storytelling. They're not focusing on developing on characters. Or developing characters, they're focusing on making preachy, stupid political points. So well done. You're just accelerating the destruction of your medium to score stupid virtue signaling uh, political points. I hate you. Good night. So next week, yes, as I say, we'll have John Nolte on, but that's us from this week. Uh, goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, we did something else interesting over the weekend, didn't we, Anne? Was there something? Did we the Super Bowl? Super Bowl, um, but no, there was something else. I, you know, um, Super Bowl. Nothing much to say. Halftime show, no politics. Excellent, fantastic. Uh, Surprising. There was, actually. Or if there was politics coming over my head, but it was nice to have a show without any politics. And uh, yes, well, okay. Listen, see you next week. Don't forget to leave comments on YouTube. Leave comments in in the podcast app. We really want more comments and more ratings. Uh, love having you bro on board. Love to tell you more about the Hunter Biden project when, we're, when we can. Please go to Unreported Story Society if you want to help us keep doing what we're doing. We Please. need your help. Yes. And he, everything, is, everything is gratefully received. Thanks and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.